Welcome to my class shopping guide for the new Inventor class for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, where I give an overview of the class, including giving comparisons to what might exist in D&D 5th Edition, and I'll go over its key features and do a demonstration combat. I won't go into full detail into all the options. This is basically to give you a sense of whether you want to be this class if you are shopping for a class for your next character. My name is Ronald. I am the rules lawyer. I am a lawyer who teaches and runs tabletop role-playing games, including D&D 5th Edition, Starfinder, and Pathfinder 2nd Edition with kids and teens. Like and subscribe to the channel if you want more content. In a nutshell, the inventor is a scientist who uses technology of the industrial era and st the steampunk and clockwork genres to do the job. And the closest analog in D&D 5th edition would be the Artificer, which does technomagic in that edition. However, the inventor does nothing that resembles the spells that are cast by characters in Pathfinder 2nd edition. It does everything using unique gadgets and technology. Also similar to the Artificer is the super invention that a inventor would have that is either a construct or a suit of armor or a weapon that is their masterpiece. And as for alchemy, that is its own separate class in Pathfinder 2e. The inventor is also characterized by being versatile and able to adapt and change their gadgets and technology when they want to. So why be an inventor? You'll want to be an inventor if you want to do amazing things with your intelligence without using magic. And that includes being able to recall knowledge very well within the Pathfinder world. Also, be an inventor if you like the fantasy of being someone who creates technology that's characteristic of steampunk, the genre, in which technology is limited to steam and is limited only by the imagination at the same time. You'll also want to be an inventor if you like the idea of crafting things for your party, including possibly magical items or alchemical items and bombs and firearms. And you'll also want to be an inventor if you like coming up with crazy ideas and inventions and solutions for problems. Why not be an inventor? Well, assuming that you fully buy into the fantasy of the class, there really are no drawbacks. To clarify, you are not casting spells, you are not a half-caster, like the Artificer is in 5e. Also, you are somewhat a jack-of-all-trades. You're not going to be the best in any particular area of adventuring. What your strength is, is in your ability to adapt to changing situations. You'll also not want to be an inventor if you're not sure whether your campaign will have downtime for you to use some of your key class features. For example, if you want to replace a destroyed construct that you made, you need a day of downtime. Or if you want to reconfigure your super invention, that requires a day. Or if you want to invent an item or craft something for your party, you often need several days for that. So the core features of the inventor. First, your key ability score is intelligence. Also, you get eight hit points per level, which puts you at squarely average among the Pathfinder 2E classes and less than what most marshals get. However, you are not a pushover. You also are proficient with simple and martial weapons, and your proficiency with those weapons advances at the same rate as martial classes. Also, you are proficient with light and medium armor, and you also have the shield block general feat, which lets you soak damage with the shield when you've readied it. And so you're not going to wilt at the front lines, and you can do uh, very good damage at the front if you lean into it with your inventions. Also, you are proficient in the crafting skill, and you get a good number of skills, especially considering that your crafting skill proficiency advances up automatically as you level up, all the way up to legendary at level 15. So giving you a healthy amount of skills, remember that your highest ability score is presumably intelligence, giving you bonus skill proficiencies. So you are a jack of all trades in this regard, similar to, say, a ranger or a bard. 
Your core class feature that lets you increase the damage you do in combat is called Overdrive, where you spend one action manipulating the gizmos on you to increase the damage that you do, and if your special invention is a construct, the damage that it does as well. And it requires a crafting skill check in combat, takes one action, and if you succeed, you add half your intelligence bonus. If you critically succeed, it's your full intelligence bonus. It's comparable to a Barbarian Rage in that it's something you usually want to do at the start of combat. The benefit of Overdrive lasts a minute, and you can attempt it once per round. When you critically fail on your check, then there's an explosion dealing fire damage to you, and if your special invention was a construct, to it as well. All inventors have the explode ability, which lets you make your innovation, which is what the class calls your super invention, so your suit of armor, your special weapon, or your construct, explode and do a five foot emanation of fire damage. An emanation in 2e means that you get to exclude what's in the middle, and they must do a reflex save, and this also scales up in the damage that you do as you level up. And also, as you level up, you can increase the radius to possibly up to 15 feet, if you'd like. This is also the only ability that all inventors have that has the unstable trait. And unstable actions are things that are particularly spectacular and powerful, but they also test the limits of your invention. So when you do an unstable action, you do a flat check, which means rolling a d20 without adding any modifiers to it. And you must get a 17 or higher if you want to do uh, another unstable action afterward. If you fail at that, then you can't. If you critically fail on the check, such as rolling a 7 or lower, then you critically fail and there's an explosion that deals damage to you and possibly also your, to your construct. You also have the Peerless Inventor class feature, which gives you for free a feat that normally characters need to be 7th level to get which is the feat that lets you, if you have downtime, come up with the formula, the recipe, to make a item. And if you get skill feats starting at second level to give yourself the ability to craft magical items or alchemical items, you get to add alchemical formulas and magic formulas to that. So it takes four days to craft a formula and then four days to craft an item. I've seen some misunderstanding on the internet about the value of crafting. It is not a way to get things more cheaply because when you craft things in 2e, you still have to pay the full price. Nor is it supposed to be a substitute for getting mundane cheap items. It's assumed that you are able to have access to a market to get things like arrows or low level scrolls. What crafting is for is to craft high level items that are usually beyond the level of the settlements where you can shop in. So if you are a 10th level party, but you are in a level 7 city, and you're looking for 10th level items, you need someone with the inventor feat to be able to unlock those items for the party. So an inventor with this feat can play a very crucial role in helping the party. At level 3, you gain the reconfigure ability, which lets you spend a day of downtime to reconfigure your special weapon, armor, or construct to change its modification, the one that you chose at level 1. And so you basically unlock the entire list of modifications for your inventor. You can also spend that day to retrain a small subset of class feats called modification feats that are alterations to your gear. Uh, the general progression of the inventor is that at level one, you get an initial modification for your weapon, armor, or construct. Then at level seven, you get a breakthrough modification, a set of things you can choose that are more powerful than the ones at level one. Then at level 9, you're able to add 1d6 of a type of energy damage or a type of physical damage to your attacks and possibly also to your constructs attacks. Then at level 13, your reconfigure ability becomes more powerful. You get to spend a day of downtime to re reconfigure any number of the modifications, your offensive boost, or modification feats. 
At level 15, you get a revolutionary modification to your special weapon, armor, or construct. Then at level 19, you get infinite invention, which lets you change your subclass during your morning preparations. That is an amazing amount of flexibility. So you can go from special weapon to special armor to special construct. You can also change any number of modifications, modification feats, or your offensive boost during your morning preparations, and also replace a destroyed construct during your morning preparations. And your signature class feature is your innovation, your masterpiece that you are improving over the course of the campaign, be it a suit of armor, a construct, or a weapon. You get to give it a modifications at level one, and then there's a stronger set at level seven, and a yet stronger set of modifications at level 15. If your innovation gets destroyed, then you get to spend a day of downtime to do a crafting check to try to replace it. At level one, you choose which of the three innovations you will have. Once you pick one, you generally can't have the abilities that the others provide, but there's a couple exceptions. One, you could have a construct using class feats for yourself. However, you don't get the modifications or overdrive that an inventor that specializes in a construct would have. So this is a big decision for an inventor. It's essentially the subclass for the inventor. And so I'm gonna go over each of them, discuss why you would pick it and its key features and also the class feats that you can look forward to and, and choose as you level up. The first innovation is the armor innovation, and you get a medium suit of armor that's either a power suit for more strength-based characters or a subterfuge suit for more dex-based characters. You also can improve your innovation armor, just like you can improve any other armor in 2E by adding magical runes to increase their armor class bonus or to increase your saving throws. And your modifications that you can add to it include increasing your defenses to various energy or physical types. You can also make yourself more mobile, have higher speed, or get different or have extra actions to move. So you can be quite tanky and mobile, and this is not while sacrificing, necessarily sacrificing your offense. You, remember, are still proficient with martial weapons and getting martial weapon proficiency and getting the bonuses that all inventors get to your damage. The modifications you can choose should be seen in the light of your reconfigurability, which lets you use downtime to change your mod. On the modifications you can add to your armor, there are many different types. On the defensive ones, you get to get resistance to damage, that is energy damage, a couple of types of energy damage, or to one type of physical damage. These can improve and become more universal as you level up as well if, by applying higher level modifications. You could get higher armor class, you can get a bonus to saves against spells, you can become concealed to all enemies, you can also have a, a force around you that makes every adjacent square to you difficult terrain for your enemies. There are other modifications that give you bonuses to athletics and to stealth. So if you want to grapple and trip enemies, or if you want to hide in combat or before combat, you get these bonuses, which are circumstance bonuses, which are the holy grail of bonuses in Pathfinder 2e, which stack with pretty much all the other bonuses you can easily get. There are also modifications that increase your speed. And all of these modifications have cool sounding names like Phlogistonic Regulator, which gives you resistance equal to half your level to cold damage and fire damage. And they all sound like something you would invent in a clockwork world. The notable class feats for the armor innovation are, there's a level four feat to give you a swim speed, a level 14 feat to give you a fly speed. There's a level eight feat to let you electrify your armor so that those who touch you get damage. There's a feat at level six, which lets you do an unstable action to give yourself an extra action to step or stride. And at level 20, you can do that every round. And there's another feat at level 18, which lets you use a reaction to reduce damage, incoming damage by 15 
and the unstable version of that reduces the incoming damage by 50. The next innovation is the construct innovation. Now remember that you could still get a construct while choosing one of the other innovations, but having the construct innovation lets you get the modifications that are exclusive to this one, and also lets you apply your overdrive bonus damage and offensive boost bonus damage to the construct. The construct has the minion trait, which is also what animal companions in 2e operate under, where you spend one of your three actions to command your minion, and that grants your minion two immediate actions. The construct has two different melee attacks that are very solid for a minion, and I compared it to the animals you can choose for your animal companion, and the construct falls within the upper range. Constructs advance similarly to animal companions in that you take feats to make them more powerful in combat or and or better with their skills. The construct is also immune to effects that you would expect a construct to be immune to, things such as poison or bleed, with the notable exception of mental effects. It looks like the designers deliberately wanted to maintain the danger of losing control of your construct or it becoming confused with its actions. But yes, constructs that inventors have are semi-sentient creatures. You also don't heal them with conventional means. You use, instead of medicine, you use crafting to do the repair action or activity on your construct. Constructs also, when they go to down to zero hit points, gain the dying condition and need someone to administer first aid, but using their crafting skill to stabilize them. And there's an important danger in that if your construct goes down to zero hit points and gains the dying condition, which also makes it broken under the game's terminology. If it that happens a second time within 10 minutes, that actually destroys your construct. And you will then need to have a day of downtime with a skill check, so it's not even guaranteed for you to replace it. And so when they go down, you generally want to stabilize them and not bring them back up unless you're, it's a very crucial situation. Constructs also notably do not have low light vision or dark vision. Now the modifications, there are many different kinds of modifications yet again for the construct innovation. There are modifications that can increase its speed that can also grant it a swim speed at higher level, uh, a climb speed, and at even higher level, a fly speed. You can also make it large instead of medium so that a medium character can ride it. You can ride a creature that is at least one size category larger than you. You can give it manual dexterity, but not the ability to activate items. You can give it a ranged attack and make it be make it have a projectile launcher and at higher levels even be a turret that does more damage and has a uh, greater ability to hit far off targets. You can also give it some basic skills in intimidation, stealth, and survival, which often come up in play. You can, at level 7, give it the level 1 weapon innovation mods, which I'll go over in the next section. You can also give it improved defenses, such as more hit points, resistance to damage, or a bonus to saves against spell effects. There are also high-level modifications that give it intelligence so that it can do two intelligence or charisma-based skills of your choice, but at legendary ability, and also a wall configuration where it spends actions to become a 30-foot long, 10-foot high wall, and can also transform back. There are class feats to take note of if you have a construct innovation. First, the basic feats to advance its basic abilities, like what those with animal companions have, are there at level 4, level 8, and level 14. At level 1, there's a feat that lets you spend one action to repair your construct and give it hit points back. Another to use a reaction to prevent it from being confused and controlled. At level 10, there's lock on, where you spend an action to help your construct aim during its turn and give it a plus two circumstance bonus. And you can spend more actions to increase that. 
and at level 15 you can spend more actions to increase it to up to plus four bonus so very significant there's a level six feet if you choose to ride your construct that lets you have lesser cover uh, while riding your construct and also if your construct explodes excludes you from the explosion there's a level six class feat where at the start of your turn it's an unstable action free action that lets you be quickened and have that extra action to command your construct and at level 20 you can have that as a permanent state for all rounds for yourself and at level 18 there's an ability that costs you three actions where you command your construct to stride up to its speed and use its attack against every creature within 30 feet with a plus two circumstance bonus. The third innovation is the weapon innovation. And this leans strongly into 2E's system of differentiating weapons with traits, not just by how much damage they do and their damage type. And so you get to add traits to weapons using your modifications. So you start off with a base weapon that is a level zero or level one weapon that you pay for. And it must be a common, simple, or martial weapon. And that forms your template. And then your modifications modify that. You can add runes to your weapon innovation, just like you can with any other weapon in 2E to make it more accurate and do extra dice of damage. When you have a weapon innovation, you get to use your overdrive ability to not only add to your basic damage type, but you can instead choose to make your additional damage fire damage. The modifications you can have add traits, useful traits, to your weapon. There are those that make you more versatile in what kind of damage you can deal. There's the versatile trait, which you can switch what damage type you do at will when you declare your attack. There's the modular trait, which lets you alternate between bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing, all three by using a single action. There are also those that add traits like grapple, shove, trip, that let you do these skill actions, athletic skill actions, which normally require a free hand, but you get to do it with your weapon. And so you get to do it with a two-handed weapon or with a one-handed weapon while wielding a shield in your other hand. And additionally, if you, what you probably should be doing, adding magical runes to your weapon, you get to add the bonus from magic runes to your skill check. There are other modifications that, combined with the ones I've mentioned, let you express pretty much any crazy idea you can come up with. There are many other possible traits you can add. At level one, there is concealable, two-hand, non-lethal, and hampering. At level seven, you get to add backstabber, sweep, freehand, ranged trip, climbing, and tethered. And at level 15, there's also backswing, shove, deadly, reach. And I'll note that if you already have a reach weapon that can reach 10 feet, you can make this reach 20 feet. It doesn't just add five. And forceful. Um, and the some of those level 15 mods are a solid just plain boost in accuracy or damage, such as removing the volley traits of longbows. There are mods that let your weapon be treated as cold iron or silver to when dealing with enemies' resistances and weaknesses, and at high level, level 15, be treated as adamantine and all of the six other sky metals in Pathfinder. Now the class feats you should take note of. Very important is the level 4 feat called dual form weapon, which lets you have a configuration, an alternate configuration for your weapon that in turn has its own modifications. So you can have a hammer that you shove people with and then transform it into a crossbow. So yes, it could be ranged and melee. It just needs two actions to switch from one form to the other. There's a higher level feat called Explosive Maneuver, where if your weapon innovation has the shove, grapple, or trip trait and you strike with it and do damage, then your next action can be the corresponding action, shove, grapple, or trip, and your weapon explosively deploys levers, tangling hooks, or similar mechanisms 
and you get to do that action and it's at the same accuracy. There is a feat at level 6 which lets you be quickened for your turn. It's a unstable action and your extra action is to either attack with your weapon or to reload it. And at level 20 you can get that as a permanent state. There's a level 18 feat which lets you use three actions to strike with your weapon against every foe within 30 feet of you as long as it doesn't need to be reloaded and your multiple attack penalty does not increase until after all of them. So it's similar to the construct ability and it even says that if you don't have reach to any cre all the creatures it leaves your hand it returns to your hand afterward. Very cool. Now I'm going to do an overview of the other class feats you can choose that are not specific to a particular innovation. There are generally many things that you can invent and modify, such as one to heal yourself or allies, uh, one to see in the dark and also make invisible creatures only concealed to you. There are feats that let you do damage in spectacular ways. For example, Megaton Strike, where you spend two actions to use your innovation to do a particularly powerful melee strike, and it does an extra die of damage. If you make it unstable, it is yet more powerful and does two extra dice of damage and can be up to four dice of damage at very high levels. There's Deep Freeze, which lets you do cold damage to a large area and possibly slow down enemies' speed. There's a feat that lets you have two alternate types of bonus damage from your offensive boost class feature. Just spend an action to change what damage type. Uh, there's another that lets you do a significant amount of persistent damage when you hit with your innovation. A few feats have the modification trait so that if you take them, you could spend a day of downtime to trade them out for a different modification feat that you don't have. And they are pretty much utility or giving you another form of mobility. The inventor also has exclusive access to feats that make it easier to craft gadgets. And gadgets are consumable technological items that include things like roller skates to skate around the battlefield, uh, blast boots to have quick jumps, gecko pads to climb, pillows to absorb fall damage. Uh, an absorbency field around you to give an AC bonus to allies, a lot of really cool ideas. And every character can craft them theoretically in Pathfinder. Uh, however, uh, they are all uncommon and so may not have access to them and th these feats give the inventor some formulas for free. And two, the inventor feats let them craft every morning some temporary gadgets that last only that day but basically are zero cost. They don't cost anything and you don't have to spend four days to craft them. And there's a high level feat that lets the inventor have a contingency gadget where they don't say what it is, they just make it. Uh, and when they need it, they bring it out and then they happen to have it. And it can be anything that they have the formula for. There are also feats that boost allies. They, um, they let you share your offensive boost, say extra fire damage or extra bludgeoning damage from your class, you get to confer that to an ally for a period of time. There's also feats that let you share your overdrive ability. So you spend an action, once you have overdrive yourself, you can spend an action to give an ally that bonus damage for a round. You can upgrade it to be for the length of your own overdrive duration. And then at 20th level, you can make it so that you can automatically share overdrive with six allies within 30 feet for the whole duration. Other notable class feats are Distracting Explosion, which is kind of like Attack of Opportunity, where if you have melee reach on an enemy that uses a concentrate action, so not the usual triggers for Attack of Opportunity, then you get to strike them. And so things like many spells uh, and other concentrate actions like commanding a minion or demoralizing, things that expect, you'd expect will require some focus. You get to surprise them with the strike. They're usually looking out for attack of opportunity, which 
has nothing to do normally with concentrate actions. And furthermore, if you use the unstable version of it, if you hit the enemy, you get to disrupt that action. So that's a very powerful one. Then there's another higher level one called Unstable Redundancies, where whenever you do an unstable action, you get to auto-succeed on that usually difficult check, flat check, after you make take the unstable action. And that auto-success, you get to have once every 10 minutes. There's a high-level feat where you get to use your crafting skill bonus on any skill check in the game that takes one minute or less, so making you even more of a strong skill class. And there's a cool feat called You Fail to Account for This, where it's a reaction, something attacks you, and you bring out some wild invention to block the attack, let's say a big pole that you extend out to prevent a ball and chain from hitting you. And you get to use your crafting DC as your armor class, and that's what they have to hit. And you're legendary in crafting by this point. Now we'll do a combat demonstration to show all three subclasses in action. First, we have Ak, who is a armor inventor. Drovin, who is a construct inventor with his friend Werp. He's actually the iconic inventor in 2E. And Wyndham, who is the weapon inventor. And this demonstration comes with a caveat that it's only level one characters, but there's only so much I can fit in this video. And I'm gonna go through pretty much everything I can uh, in this demonstration. The heroes are trying to infiltrate a monastery that they know to be guarded by evil hobgoblins. And they have been trying to approach stealthily. This is the late afternoon. And however, they have been noticed by the enemy, uh, which is on high alert and have their weapons out. So this is the point where they mutually know where everyone, where the other side is. So this is where combat begins. So we start with Droven, who with his friend Werp, wants to now attack this soldier. The Droven wants to overdrive. Uh, it's generally something that you want to do early on as an inventor to get bonus damage. And so he's gonna do a crafting skill check takes one action and because he's level one it will take a 15 to succeed he needs an eight on this roll or higher oh he does not succeed so he will fail and he cannot attempt uh overdrive again this round yet he will still go ahead and uh, attack the hobgoblin he will uh use the skill action demoralize against the hobgoblin soldier and try to debuff it before attacking so he will do an intimidation check. He's not trained in intimidation. And a 12 will not succeed against the 15 that he needed, the will DC of the enemy. With his last action, he will command Werp, which gives Werp two actions. And this will be to stride up to the hobgoblin and strike it with his fist. So he will not hit. So next is the hobgoblin soldier. The Hobgoblin Soldier uh, wants to, he's a strong melee character with a steel shield and a long sword. He wants to put some pressure on them. He runs up to the enemy and he's gonna try to now strike Wyndham with his long sword. And a 16 will miss. He will now raise his shield, which gives him a plus two circumstance bonus to AC until his next turn. Wyndham uh, also wants to, he's next, and he wants to overdrive, and he's going to do a crafting skill check. However, the overdrive has requires manipulating his gizmos. It has the manipulate trait, and that provokes attack of opportunity from the hobgoblin soldier. It is one of the few enemies, the minority of enemies, that do, do have attack of opportunity. So... And if this critically succeeds, it will actually disrupt this action. So here comes the attack. That's another miss. He was lucky there. And Wyndham will proceed with his skill check. He uh, needs to get a 15 also. So he succeeds. So he now has plus two fire damage 
it's a regular success, so he gets to have half of his intelligence bonus added in fire damage to strikes that he makes. With his second action, he will now try to strike the Hobgoblin Soldier. And he has an Elven Curve Blade. And he misses. Okay, well, um, with his third action, he will use his class feat. He has the level one inventor class feat called Tamper, where he tries to um, tamper with the enemy's weapon or armor to give a debuff. If he tampers with the enemy's armor, they get a penalty to speed and become flat-footed for a short time. And if they tamper with the weapon, which he'll do now, is it will give the enemy a minus two penalty to attacks and damage with the weapon and yes so here is the crafting check versus the reflex dc of the hobgoblin soldier now this has the manipulate trait also however the hobgoblin soldier has already used its reaction and can, so cannot use attack of opportunity so here comes a skill check a crafting check and that succeeds so the enemy is going to have a minus two penalty, circumstance penalty, to attack rolls and damage rolls until the start of Wyndham's next turn. So with uh, that, his uh, turn's over. The Hobgoblin Soldier on the balcony is up here and is wielding a short bow. So with its first action, it wants to get a good view of the enemy. And with its next action, it will want to fire at Ak. It sees that little goblin. And here we go. It's a plus eight. That will miss. There's been a lot of missing today. And that will miss also. So uh, Lucky Ak. Ak is our armor inventor. And what he'll do is he will use his class feat explosive leap. Um, yes. This is a spectacular, unstable action that he's about to do. He's going to stride here, and what Unstable Leap does is it lets him leap, uh, propel himself 30 feet in a direction. And at the end of the 30 feet, he gets to do one action and then fall if he's not already supported by something afterward. Um, and so he's going to do this, requires no check. He's going to safely go up to the balcony so he won't fall. Now, Explosive Leap is an unstable action. So he needs to roll a 17 or higher on this flat check. So it's a roll, a d20 roll with no modifiers to it to be able to do future unstable actions. And he succeeds. So he gets to do Explosive Leap again later or explode later if he so chooses. Um, well, with his last action, he's going to use his Ancestry Feet Goblin Song to sing songs with annoying, repetitive lyrics to uh, the Hobgoblin Soldier to see if he can lower his mental defenses. So he will do a Perform check, which is something he's pretty good at for an inventor, and uh, against the will DC of the Hobgoblin Soldier. That's a success. So he needed to beat a 15. So the Hobgoblin Soldier has a minus one penalty to perception and will. Uh, Ak hopes to demoralize the Hobgoblin Soldier with something he'll say next turn. Okay, we now enter round two. And the GM rolls a secret roll, which uh, the players don't say anything about, but it does make them a little paranoid. Droven is next, and... He wants to use Overdrive again. He uh, didn't succeed last round. And although it has the Manipulate trait, he will not provoke an attack of opportunity because the soldier has already used its reaction. So he will try to Overdrive again. Uh, 23 succeeds. He needed a 15. And it's not a critical success, so he gets it plus 2 to his base damage when he attacks with when he or his construct attack the enemy. Overdrive lasts one minute. So he will now command warp to stride here so that there is flanking 
and have Worth attack a now flanked and therefore flat-footed soldier who has a minus two penalty from being flat-footed. So here comes the fist. A 17 misses by one. Okay. Um, the plus two shield bonus for the soldier for having raised the shield is helping him. Drovin is going to use his last action to try to hit with his Warhammer. And he does not have the multiple attack penalty because the minion strikes do not advance your penalty. And that will hit. So he will roll damage and he gets to add his overdrive damage of plus two to this. So it's going to be seven damage to the Hobgoblin. The Hobgoblin actually has the shield block reaction and could soak damage with his shield. However, he used up his reaction on attack of opportunity, so he takes the full damage. So he will take seven. All right, the Hobgoblin soldier is now next, and his shield bonus to AC expires. Okay, he um, has a tampered weapon, so minus two to attack and damage. And he could interact to remove that penalty, uh, but he has another plan. He wants to go ahead and attack Werp with his longsword, and that's going to be a hit even with the minus two penalty, and do damage. This will be nine, which is reduced to seven damage because of the tamper. And um, he will then use his next two actions to walk over to these stairs and try to uh, get help from his ally up in the balcony and uh, use his last action to raise his shield. He wants to, he's a little more cautious now. Next is Wyndham, who, when he tampered with the enemy, he had to release his grip on his two-handed weapon in order to have a free hand because that had the manipulate trait. So he will change his grip so that he has a two-handed grip, which itself has the manipulate trait. And then he will stride here. And with his elven curve blade, he will use his elven curve blade to try to trip the hobgoblin soldier. And usually this skill action requires a free hand. But because he has chosen to modify his elven curve blade, it has the trip trait as well as the grapple trait. Uh, it's called entangling form. So he will try to trip the hobgoblin soldier. So this is uh, going to have to beat his reflex DC of 16. And he has an athletic skill check to succeed on here. And that does not succeed. And in fact, a critical failure would make him him trip. He would fall prone. He doesn't want to do that, especially in front of this guy. So he's going to spend his hero point to re-roll this. Every character gets a hero point at the start of a session. And a 19 will succeed. So um, the shield bonus only affects AC, not reflex DC. So the Hobgoblin Soldier is now going to fall prone. And the benefit of having your weapon have the trip trait is that he doesn't need to release his hand off of a two-handed weapon to do this. You don't have to go through what we just had to do of restoring your grip on your weapon. So the party's in for a surprise. There is a fire method that opens a door and joins the battle. And it flies. So they have something else to contend with now. Okay, the Hobgoblin Soldier is... Um, uh, has a free hand, uh, a bow only requires one hand to hold, two hands to actually fire. So um, he's going to move right here, and with that free hand, he's able to shove Aquafit um, off of the balcony. So uh, this goes up against Axe Fortitude DC, which is going to be 15, and the Hobgoblin will use Athletics. And that succeeds. So. Um, and Ack, meanwhile, um, I'll get to Ack in a moment, but the Hobgoblin Soldier, when he shoves, gets to choose to go with what he pushed. So, well, forward five feet. 
Act, meanwhile, uh, can use the grab and edge reaction to try to not fall off the balcony. The balcony, uh, the GM says it'll be a level one check, level uh, so 15. Um, and so Ak uh, needs a reflex save. However, Ak is wielding something in each hand. He has a shield in his offhand. So because he has no free hand, he has to actually use one of the objects he's holding to grab the edge, which requires a critical success. So he needs a 25 on this reflex save. And he fails. So he will fall to the ground, which makes him prone. However, he uh, has a contingency. He uh, talked to the GM about doing a little crafting, and he has crafted a gadget. It's called the Impact Foam Chassis. It's a device, it's like an inflatable airbag, that whenever he falls, it doesn't require any action of any kind. It just inflates and absorbs some of the fall damage. The level one version absorbs up to 20 damage and has its own hit point pool. Um, he, um, he would take normally half the number of feet he just fell in damage, so five. However, um, and so the chassis is going to absorb all of that and lose five hit points. And furthermore, it gives Ak the immobilized condition. He's surrounded by this gigantic pillow, uh, and it even gives him lesser cover, plus one AC against attacks. So uh, we'll see what he does in a second. Uh, the Hobgoblin Soldier, with his last action, will fire on that now flat-footed Ak, who also benefits from plus one AC. So let's see what happens. Um, a 15 um, would hit because he's flat-footed. However, the cover, the pillow provides cover and prevents that hit. Okay, on Axe's turn, he's now immobilized, so he can't do anything that is a move action, move trait. So he cannot stand up while he, he has to escape first, which is its own action. It's a, um check versus the DC of 15 in the case of this this item and um, he gets to use his unarmed strike bonus which is six or acrobatics or athletics so he's going to use acrobatics which is plus six and critically succeed uh, which actually lets him stand up and also stride five feet um, as part of his escape and then he will use his last action not to demoralize the soldier, but he see this, sees this new threat um, of the fire method, and he is going to raise his shield. We are now in round three. So Droven will um, try to help his buddy. He's going to move here and do the... He has the level one class feat haphazard repair, which lets him repair his innovation and right now his innovation is uh could use some help so the repair action is a crafting check and this special feat lets him do it as one action and if he succeeds he will heal him or repair him for 10 hit points if he critically succeeds for 20 and this improves as he increases his crafting skill to expert master legendary um, so he will do this crafting check first, and here we go. Okay, he does not succeed. Okay. Um, furthermore, it is an unstable action, so he may lose the ability to do this with this flat check. Okay, a 14 um, is rolled, so he fails, which is unfortunate. He failed at helping his friend. Um, and by the way, if he had rolled a seven or lower, he would be critically failing on his flat check and there would be an explosion and, uh, he would take damage. With his third action, he's gonna try to take advantage of the soldier's prone condition and send warp there to attack with two actions warp gets. Um, oh, but the soldier still has a shield raise, so still it's worth doing. And that hits. So Warp will do, ooh, Warp will do um, four damage, which actually is six damage because of Overdrive still being in effect. And the soldier still has his reaction, so he's gonna shield a block. 
Um, he has a wooden shield, so that gets reduced to three damage, both three damage to the soldier and three to his shield. So his shield is not broken yet. So that's Droven's turn. Uh, the Hobgoblin soldier is now up, and he is going to stand up with his first action. He will try to strike Werp, and that's a miss. And he will also try to go up, try to join up with his ally. Okay, Wyndham um, is worried about this fire method, and he's going to recall knowledge. And remember, inventors have high intelligence. Um, and use a skill. Uh, let's say he's going to use Arcana here. Though religion's probably a better bet. The GM still allows it with a slightly higher DC. And that succeeds. Um, he learns that the fire method um, has a breath weapon, a 15-foot cone that can set you on fire. So he tells that to the party and they resolve to spread out uh, to not give it the chance to harm several of them at once. So um, what he now does is he strides up to here, one, two, three, four, five, and he is gonna, mm, he wants to end this hobgoblin. He uh, has this fire damage on his weapon, so he's gonna strike. And that's a hit. And eight will have two added to it um, and kill the hobgoblin soldier. His overdrive has, um, made the difference, and the soldier is dead. The fire method's next, and he will fly down right here and uh, use his breath weapon on these enemies. So uh, I actually have a nice special effect here. Let's see, right there. And um, they will have to make basic reflex saves. Basic meaning that they can take zero damage or double damage, depending on the degree of success. And uh, this one, um, the goblin fails, and Droven will also fail. So they're going to take the full damage of the breath weapon and um, get set on fire. It'll be 2d4 fire damage. Um, so that is not good. They're both on fire. So next is the hobgoblin soldier, um, who is going to try to kill Ak with his short bow. And that will hit um, and do seven damage. Now, Ak has his shield raised, and he has a shield block reaction. So he actually will use that reaction now. And um, he has his reaction back since he had a turn. And he uh, reduces that to two damage. And that gets applied to his shield and to his current hit points. Um, the Hobgoblin Soldier will follow up with other attacks and miss. And Ak is next. And he's going to open up with Overdrive. He hasn't used it yet. And it will have the benefit of not only giving him more damage, but also he has the modification Phlogistonic Regulator, which lets his armor give him uh, two resistance to fire damage, which is crucial right now. So he will use his crafting check. Oh, a uh, that will explode um, and do fire damage to him. And he does not want that to happen. He's going to spend his hero point. Um, and if he's already spent it, he probably deserves one right now for his cool moves. Okay, that succeeds. So he now gets to add two to his damage with his strikes. And he now gets resistance two to fire damage. So. He's now going to stride up with relative confidence up to this fire method, uh, actually right here. He's going to now try to attack with his rapier, and I've decided he has a rapier since he's a dex build. So this will be um, a 24. That hits, and he gets to add his overdrive bonus to damage. Um, that'll be 8 damage to the fire method. So, uh, solid. Um, and because he has persistent damage, at the conclusion of his turn, he t um, takes the damage, which is going to be 1d4, 4 damage, and he resists 2 of that, so he takes 2 damage um, from the persistent damage. 
and he rolls a flat check and needs to get a 15 or higher to end the persistent damage, and he does not succeed. Okay, Droven. Um, he is going to try to flank the uh, fire method and try to attack. And this is now a flanked fire method. And miss. Um, and he will then command warp to try to attack with his fist. That's a miss. So Joven's turn ends. He takes persistent fire damage, which is four. And he has to roll a 15 on a flat check to end the condition. He is no longer on fire. Okay. Next is Wyndham, who wants to go up to the soldier and explode. It takes two actions and um, he could have struck with his weapon, which is probably the better decision, but I want to show this. Um, he's going to use his Elven Curve Blade, his innovation, to make it explode. Um, it does have the manipulate trait, so the Hobgoblin Soldier will get an attack of opportunity. Now, the soldier does not he has a free hand, so he's going to be able to do this attack with his fist. Um, same attack bonus. That's a hit. And it's going to do d4 plus 3 damage. So um, 6 damage to the elf. It was not a critical success, so he gets to go forward with his manipulate action. And um, he's going to explode. Uh, and we have another cool effect for this. Uh, here we go. There we go. And uh, he's going to do 2d6 fire damage. 7 average. And um, force the enemy to do a reflex save. And he fails. So he's going to take full damage from this effect. And it's an unstable effect. So Wyndham, if he wants to do uh, more unstable actions, he's going to need to succeed on this flat check and get a 17. He does not. Okay, that's his turn. Next is the Fire Method, who uh, will now try to bite Droven um, and get set him on fire again. That's a hit, and that will do a combination of piercing and fire damage of four. Uh, the Fire Method, um, and he's on fire now. And the Fire Method will also try to set work on fire with a bite and does not succeed. With his last, with its last action, he will fly straight up, and flying straight up is like difficult terrain. Um, or five, five, 45 degree or steeper angle is difficult terrain. He's gonna go up here, and uh, and then over here. So he's uh, 15 feet up in the air. All right, he has a fly speed of 25. Next is the hobgoblin soldier, and. He wants to switch to melee now, so he releases his bow, which is a free action, then takes out his longsword. He could take out his shield, but he doesn't have an action to raise it, so he's just going to attack twice with his sword. That's a hit, and uh, that will deal 7 damage. He's in trouble, Wyndham. He is going to go down to 1 hit point, and then this hobgoblin soldier will try again and miss. Okay, Ack! is next and he feels pretty bold with his resistance so he's gonna walk here and try to spread out in case it has breath weapon again and um ready in action which readying requires two actions to ready a single action with a trigger you define if the method goes up to him he will strike uh so he'll do that with his rapier then Oh, he is going to take persistent damage. Two is going to be completely resisted by his armor, and he does a flat check. Uh, he's still on fire, but he's just grinning. Okay, next is Droven, who is on fire again. Well, um, he this guy is in the air now. However, um, he prepared today. He hit the modification that he added to warp is projectile launcher. So a projectile launcher has a, um, it's a ranged unarmed attack and it has a range increment of 30 feet and it has propulsive trait, which lets him add half of his strength bonus to damage. 
So Warp is going to make this attack. It's within the first range increment. And uh, try to hit. That's a miss. But it'll get a second shot. Ah, uh, that's a miss too. Too bad. Um, but yeah, uh, he's able to make range attacks with his um, Constructs projectile launcher. The next thing he'll do is just ready a strike um, to hit the fire method also, if the fire method gets within range. Okay, Wyndham has thought about this. He's going to make a single strike and then try to get out of there. Um, or back away at least. So he will uh, swing with his Elven Curve Blade. And that's a hit. Hopefully this is enough damage. Um, that's six damage because of Overdrive. Um, and he will now step and then uh, walk right here. So he stepped first and then moved here. So that way the step does not provoke reactions and lets him avoid the attack of opportunity. Okay, the fire method um, recharges his breath weapon every 1d4 rounds. So he has not recharged it yet. So what he'll do is um, go down and uh, let's see if he's smart enough to try to avoid their readied actions. He is. So um, it's going to go down here and uh, try to hit warp with his, its try to bite warp, and that's a miss. And then fly back up into the air um, over here. Okay, the Hobgoblin Soldier is going to drop what he's holding, pick up his bow, so that's one action, and then try to fire at that Wyndham. That's a miss, and that's a miss. Wyndham is pretty lucky. Um, Ak is, um, hmm, he is going to see if he can, he doesn't really have any strong ranged options, and he has a shield. What he's going to do is, uh, raise his shield and then ready another strike. He, he can also try to... Mm, he'll raise his shield. Okay. I was going to say, he could also try to overcharge and try to go for a critical success to get plus four damage. But it may... One, it might critically fail and end everything. Um, but uh, also... He's not sure that will really make a difference. He thinks he can hit it hard enough already. So he readies an action to strike after raising his shield. Okay. Oh, and he takes uh, Persistent Fire, uh, which is completely resisted by him. And he will try to put out the fire. And then Drover, Droven, he will now command Warp to try to attack that Hobgoblin Soldier. Because it's making more attacks with its ranged weapon per turn. Uh, and use its projectile launcher, and that's a hit for three damage. Damage is damage. And then try to hit one more time. That's a miss. Okay. So Wyndham is now going to go forward, and with his last action, um, attack with his Elfin Curve Blade. That's a hit. So he's, yep, nine damage to the Hobgoblin Soldier, takes it out of the battle. Um... One action left, and he is going to do something cool. Well, to me. <laughs> he um, had done overdrive to give himself fire damage near the beginning of the battle, but that's not obviously not going to be useful against the fire method. It was optional to do make it fire damage. So he's going to do overdrive again, and if he succeeds, even a regular success, um, he gets to reconfigure it to his base elven curve blade damage, which is slicing or slashing. So he will do this uh, crafting check, succeed. He now has plus two slashing damage. So the fire method um, wants to go after that robot with projectile launcher and is going to uh, dive down and attack. Uh, that's, a, that's a hit and we'll do nine damage. Um, and knock out Warp. So, um, this is, uh, and, and then we'll use its uh, next actions to fly upward. Next is Ak, and he's going to do something amazing. He is going to stride forward just to right here, and because he can still do unstable actions, um, 
he's going to use Explosive Leap to propel himself up to melee range of the method. And also he is a um, Razor Tooth Goblin, so he has a Jaws attack as well. Um, because he falls um, after his next action, according to the ability. Um, okay, but first it's an unstable ability, so he does a flat check to see if um, he can still do future unstable abilities. That's a critical failure. So his armor explodes a, a bit, there's an explosion, and he takes one fire damage, except that he resists it because of his modification. Okay, now he's going to try to bite it. And with his jaws, that's a hit for uh, four damage. And um, that was cool. He gets a, definitely gets a hero point. And he's going to fall for um, seven damage. Uh, maybe it wasn't the wisest thing to do. And he fall unconscious. And he's still on fire and um, takes a 1d4 fire damage. And he resists one of it. However, that um, puts him at dying too. <laughs> um, okay, that's uh, that was fun. Next is Droven, um, who's had it um, with this fire method. Uh, well, first of all, he's going to administer first aid to Werp, which is two actions and a crafting check to make sure it's fine. He's not going to... Oh, okay. He's going to do a crafting check. And, okay, Werp is now stable. And um, I'm just going to... Okay. He is... Um, next, uh, with his last action, he is going to... Um, try well. He's gonna try to demoralize the air method. Um, say something about it that's insulting that I can't think of anything creative for right now. Uh, that does not succeed. Okay, Windham also has a short bow, so he wants to switch to that. And also, his overdrive ability applies to all of his strikes, not just to his weapon innovation. So he's going to release his Elven Curve Blade as a free action, take out his short bow, and then as a second action, loose an arrow. That's a hit! And that is actually seven damage from Overdrive, and that's a victory for our heroes. Uh, and he is going to next, you know, sprint down to the party. So Ak is on fire. Um, Let's just see if uh, he survives. He uh, First, at the start of his turn, he's going to do a recovery check. He does not. He critically fails, so he would die at this point, but he spends that hero point to uh, stabilize and not gain the wounded condition. And then he, um, at the end of his turn, he takes one more fire damage, which brings him down to dying one. And, uh, and then he, um, is he still on fire? He's not on fire anymore, but his party is confident they can help him now. Uh, so anyway, that's our demonstration combat and uh, uh, showing all of the abilities, I think, of the inventors, all the subclasses at level one. And now let's move on to the closing statement. So is the inventor a tank or a support character? Or maybe it's an offensive character. M maybe it's a blaster. The answer is all of the above, potentially. The combat demonstration showed that the inventor is quite strong as a martial character with its martial weapon proficiency. It can defend itself just fine with shield block and it has it can have uh, a good armor class. Uh, but with its inventions, it can choose to lean into any of these various roles. It can choose to do more damage by spending an action for overdrive. It can choose to do physical damage or energy damage. It can choose to blast with explosion. It can get some mobility. It can increase its defense as well with the armor modifications. And not shown here, but there are other modifications uh, at higher levels or feats that can let you heal allies or share bonuses, offensive bonuses with allies too. So th this is a class that is not about shining in any one particular area, but is about being able to adapt to situations. And if they have a day of downtime, they can always reconfigure what they're good at. So in this example, maybe our three characters 
would have retreated and decided to reassault the monastery, but this time giving themselves boosts to speed. And maybe if they were higher level, they would have their offensive boost key to cold damage to do more extra damage to fire enemies. And maybe Wyndham would have given his melee weapon the shove trait so that he can use the advantage of those balconies to shove enemies over them. So there are many, many possibilities. And with they generally want to use their intelligence to gather information, do research, to know what challenges are ahead. And the weapon inventor, when they become level four, could take dual form weapon and be able to switch their weapon from one form to another, even between melee and ranged and back using a sing using two actions. And I wasn't able, for obvious reasons, to highlight the other another strength of the inventor, which is to be able to craft during downtime, which is a huge boon for a party. So yeah, that's the overview uh, of this class, and I hope you can make an informed shopping decision when you play Pathfinder 2E in deciding what class you want to be. I hope this class shopping guide was helpful. If you haven't yet, please like and subscribe to the Rules Lawyer channel. I'll be putting out more videos soon teaching Pathfinder 2E and also discussing tabletop role-playing games, including the history of D&D &D in general. So if you want to get notifications about my upcoming videos, ring the bell as well. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this and thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.